Welcome to World War II, 1939 to 1945. I'm Dr. King Owen, and in this lecture, lecture 25, we'll look at the origins of the conflict from the U.S. perspective. In the beginning, the United States endeavored to remain neutral during World War II as its opening phases evoked memories of World War I. So as the world is sort of marching towards global conflict with Germany, Japan, and Italy, the U.S. is saying, no, not us. We're not involved. We're not interested. Part of that came from the Nye Committee, who uh, was headed by Gerald Nye, not the science guy, who accused arms dealers of pushing the U.S. into World War I, and he remained a committed isolationist uh, throughout the 30s and early 40s, arguing that conflict, world conflict, wars, such as was happening in Europe, was just another excuse for weapons dealers to make money. The United States passed, between 1935 and 1937, a series of neutrality acts. There are several of them, and they each have their slight variations. Uh, but it in, overall, the intent is the U.S. will not sell weapons to warmongering nations. So if a nation's in conflict, no weapons for you. That will change by 1939 which allows weapons on a cash and carry basis. You would have thought in the midst of the Great Depression that there would be eagerness to make some money and the U.S. would seize on the opportunity to sell weapons. However, so great is the desire to remain neutral and remain aloof that up until 1939, the answer is no. But there are people who are asking, should the U.S. be involved in the conflicts going around the world? Throughout the 30s, Germany, Japan, and Italy have been engaging in bellicose and belligerent actions that the U.S. would have normally opposed if this would be President Wilson in World War I. In 1937, Franklin D. Roosevelt gave a quarantine speech. This is in response to Japanese aggression, and he raises the question in the speech, is it a good idea for a country to actually limit war before it gets worse? Invoking a medical metaphor, the idea of quarantining sick patients, FDR asks, would it not be better to oppose war before it actually becomes a worldwide problem. But the United States is not ready to listen to any kind of suggestion at this point that the U.S. should be involved in conflicts around the world, even with Japan, who has been uh, pretty aggressive towards the United States in the 30s. So great is the memory of World War I, and so dominating is the attention on the depression that Americans are amazingly just talk to the hand because the face don't understand when it comes to world conflict. Swiftly did Germany move through Europe once the uh, Germans decided they were in a position to be unstoppable. They remilitarized the Rhineland um, they uh, did Anschluss with Austria um, under the pretext of, you know, uniting with um, the former part of the German Empire. Um, the need for Lebensraum, or living space, um, animated German expansion, at least that was the official explanation. But Germany also was utilizing war and preparation for war as unification behind Hitler's ideas and plans. So this map shows the expansion, and quickly after 1939, it became very apparent that Germany was um, almost unstoppable. 
The United States, as well as European countries, had engaged in a policy of appeasement. Appease means to please. It's to give in to a bully in order to get that bully to leave you alone. And not only did Europeans do this, but the United States did this. Out of a memory of World War I and the effects of the Depression, as it made these countries weary of conflict, can we just ignore it and maybe it will go away? So Europeans had appeased Germany until war started in 1939. They gave in to Hitler's demands and Hitler's expansion and Hitler's militarization. The United States committed appeasement with Japan. And that's a, a fact that we almost sort of forget. We think appeasement was some European problem. But the United States had had run-ins with the Japanese through the 30s um, and didn't really do anything about it. And in fact, the U.S. did nothing to Japanese aggression um, to slow it down, but instead actually fueled it by selling Japan oil and scrap metal until 1941, the United States actively encouraged Japanese aggression. You can see here the Japanese empire as of 1930 is in the red, um, but their sphere of influence extended into Manchuria. Um, by uh, 1933, they had spread significantly into Asia, threatening the Chinese. Um, and it's quite possible uh, you could have read about or discussed uh, the horrific rape of Nanjing, um, which the, the Japanese uh, did unspeakably brutal things. And the U.S. did nothing. In fact, we just sold them more oil and scrap metal. How much? So this chart details the percent of Japanese imports coming from the United States. So 79% of their oil, 80% of the oil, 84% of the oil, slowing down by 1940, but we're still fueling them. Steel and scrap iron um, up until 1941. So the Japanese depended on American products in order to be aggressive. So as war fever is starting to heat up and the nation um, is seeing the rest of the world um, enter the conflagration that we call World War II, Americans are starting to debate, should the U.S. be involved? What should the American role be? FDR pushed for every measure but war, knowing that war was unpopular, knowing that he didn't really have a ground to stand on to call for U.S. intervention in an actual military way. So for example, in 1940, the destroyers for bases deal gave scrapped ships to England. So, well, they're gonna be junk. We might as well give them away anyway. We'll get a little something for our trouble. So what's the big deal? Um, it seems a little easy to justify that as opposed to actually you know, selling them weapons. And the reason for the limits on FDR's behavior has to do with the American anti-war mood. A group of folks known as the America First Committee called for isolation from the war, saying that the US was better off not being involved. We did not need to sacrifice our sons in another needless European war. And in fact, the America First Committee courted ties with Hitler's regime. Nazis were at work in the U.S. spreading propaganda to keep the U.S. out of the war. Another factor that uh, turned the U.S. away from being helpful and being interested in European problems was anti-Semitism. The reports coming out of Europe were starting to paint a picture of the cruelty and the eventual absolute evil of 
the Nazi plans for Jews um, in Europe. But reports coming to the United States were routinely ignored by the public at large. So mostly these circulated in Jewish communities. Rabbis knew, folks knew, but the American public said, eh, not our problem. Those aren't our people. We don't have to worry about them. In fact, in 1939, a bill that would have allowed 20,000 Jewish children to come to the U.S., the Wagner-Rogers bill, is actually defeated. America is saying no to children in 1939. That's how much um, U.S. policy is against helping these poor people um, in Europe. One of the saddest cases is the St. Louis, um, a passenger ship with 939 passengers. Most of them were Jews. Um, they tried to land in Cuba, the US and Canada, and they were rejected um, largely in all three uh, locations. The ship had to return to Europe and about a quarter of them were killed in the Holocaust. So America and other countries actively, actively denied help to people who needed it. One of the Americans who wanted to comment on this um, in a very, very strong way was Dr. Seuss. Of course, you probably recognize his art style here in these cartoons. And he's making the comment that America is really being ignorant of the world's problems. We're being selfish that America putting itself first is saying that it didn't care about foreign children because those children don't really matter. And pointing out in the second cartoon that the America First Committee essentially was Nazi propaganda. The America First Committee was headed um, by numerous folks um, but none more famous than Charles Lindbergh, uh, the famous 1920s aviator, um, husband to poet Anne Morrow Lindbergh, and parents of the famous Lindbergh baby that was kidnapped. It was a huge um, national uh, story in their lives. So people looked up to Lindbergh. He was a hero, and he said no to war, no to U.S. involvement, that if we got involved as a nation, Americans would be hurt, America would be damaged, our freedom would be at stake. Here's an example of some of the propaganda that appeared sponsored by Nazi influence, suggesting that FDR's government was governed, controlled by this group of Jews who uh, represented um, the sort of Jewish conspiracy of domination um, that Hitler himself had propagated in Europe, and which of course had been around for quite some time. So you can see named here are all of these folks that supposedly help make New Deal policy and are swaying FDR. So anti-Semitic propaganda like this help to discourage U.S. intervention and U.S. help for the people suffering in Europe. Dr. Seuss tried to make the argument that the U.S. was being short-sighted, ignorant, and stupid by ignoring what was going on, but couldn't gain any traction. There's just no movement to join the war yet. But we're getting close, because in 1941, the U.S. passed the Lend-Lease Act, where the U.S. would lend supplies to the Allies, crucial supplies to help them fight their war and possibly, of course, keep the U.S. out of it if they did a good job. Uh, one uh, congressman quipped that the Lend-Lease Act kind of made no sense. It's like He said it was like lending chewing gum. You didn't want it back after it was used. So really, this is a pro-war measure, but being sold as a defensive measure. In August of 1941, the United States met with Britain 
um, to agree on potential war aims and goals should the U.S. be brought into the war. This was the Atlantic Charter, which I'll have to say um, is pretty much plagiarized from Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. If you ran this through Turnitin, um, definitely it would get a high Turnitin score. Franklin D. Roosevelt fully expected the U.S. would enter the war. We know that he was waiting for the moment, waiting for something that the U.S. could use as a pretext for war. Um, doesn't get that until late in 1941. The U.S. had cut off supplies to Japan, so we're no longer selling um, scrap metal, oil, and things to the Japanese. And finally, December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. In an attack that they thought would cripple the U.S. ability to respond to them, and so they felt like they were getting a quick blow in and then we'd be devastated. Um, they were, of course, wrong. And this becomes the necessary pretext for going to war. We've been attacked and it's actually a devastating attack in terms of the number of Americans who are killed. So now we have the excuse FDR is looking for. After, uh, after the attack, FDR announced that this would be a day that would live in infamy, infamy as the air forces of the naval of the Empire of Japan attacked the American Navy as they slept at Pearl Harbor. The U.S is now at war. Up until um, the beginning of the war, your uh, public opinion in America was dead set against the European conflict. Um, if the US, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you asked Americans, should the US be involved? 57% um, said in 1938 that the US could stay out. In 1940, um, when people were asked if Americans should send troops if it looked like England is losing, 77% said no. Uh, when asked if people thought it was a mistake for the U.S. to be in World War I, 39% said yes. So clearly pro-war uh, opinions are very weak up until Pearl Harbor. Dr. Seuss uh, took his job as an editorial cartoonist very seriously and continued to push the pro-war message again and again and again. So here's a, a pro Lend lease cartoon. It's World War II after December 7th for the United States because of Pearl Harbor. And clearly it's such a catastrophic attack that Americans are galvanized by it. Japanese treachery, you know, they say peaceful things to our faces and stab us in the back. But now it's time for Uncle Sam to roll up his sleeves, go across the Pacific and teach those Japanese a lesson. I will also say the devastation of Pearl Harbor makes it easier to justify absolute destruction of the Japanese by the war's end. In fact, Americans would simply be paying them back for what they did to the U.S. at Pearl Harbor, where thousands of Americans died. It would be the greatest attack on Americans until 9-11. I'll see you next time for the U.S. Uh, mobilization of the war. That will be part two of this lecture. Until then, take care.